pleasure to be here, as always. And many of you are staying in this hotel, but some of you are online and may not be staying in this hotel. Uh, but I was curious to see this uh, breakfast announcement and a nice quotation from Gunther, who it says, all happiness depends on a leisurely breakfast. So I suspect that some of you are taking this seriously and are not here yet, uh, but just to take that home as a thought. I'm going to start off, and I'm going to look at what's been happening across the world, but I'm not going to talk about the United States. I focused a lot on that last year, so I'm going to start elsewhere. Normally, you would expect me to show some joke slides, a few quotations, but I'm going to start on a very serious note. Earlier this week, I was in Poland, which, of course, borders Ukraine, and I was with colleagues and friends from Ukraine, Professor Boris Mankowski, who many of you know, my very good friend from Kiev, or Kiev, as they call it, and he was telling me how desperate the situation is there, and none of us thought this time last year that we would believe that anything like this could happen. And he showed me these slides that he had taken personally at the Maidan, which is Ukrainian for square, in the center of Kiev, or Kiev. And this was the scene just a few weeks ago that crossed the television screens across the world. Uh, these are the uh, people protesting against Yanukovych, who, of course, was against further ties with the European Union. And this was the response. And the response did not stop there. It got worse, uh, as you all know. Uh, and the response was a, a, literally a battle between armed policemen and unarmed, but predominantly, protesters. There were fires, there were burnt out vehicles, uh, and this is uh, Russian for press on the hat there. The press were, of course, at great risk too. This is a burnt out car, as you see, an army van, uh, and these are doctors in action. Uh, and it got worse, as you know, and this is what the response was. Here you see a marksman who was filmed, and I have the movie, and as soon as he's realized he's been filmed, he shot somebody using this site and then moved on somewhere else. These are some of our colleagues here. They were too frightened to take people to the hospital because the police were waiting for them and took them straight to jail. So they set up a field hospital. This is 2014. It's difficult to believe. Uh, and of course, there were probably 100 or more fatalities, murders. Uh, and there are many wreaths uh, uh, strewn across the center of Kyiv in Ukraine. In Crimea, as you know, these supposedly non-Russian soldiers appeared uh, and continue to appear, and there have been uh, some uh, officers of the Ukrainian Navy killed. Uh, and these were what the president said, or Medvedev, the prime minister, weren't actually Russian, but curiously, if you look here, uh, this is a Russian license plate. A slight giveaway. So this is what has been happening in 2014, and I'm sure that all of us would wish to send our colleagues in Ukraine uh, all the best uh, for this very difficult time. In fact, at the European Diabetes Association, we have received letters from doctors in Russian-speaking areas say that they detest what is going on and they back the independence of Ukraine. I've shown this slide before. The war against diabetes. Over the course of a war, there will be many battles, local national, regional, and global. But when war does occur, people with diabetes suffer more, and those with foot problems suffer more too. So our hearts go out to our colleagues in Ukraine. It's interesting, our chief medical officer, Sir Liam Donaldson, wrote these words, if you always do what you always did, you will always get what you always got. And now we're seeing just that. We thought the Cold War was finished. So let's turn to the diabetic foot across the world and start in Europe, which is what we're trying to prevent, and see really what's been happening recently. As we know from Jerry Raymond's and many other centers, there has been a steady fall when you have a good diabetes foot care team. I can't prove it's any component of that team. Education alone, we cannot prove, reduces ulcers, but education as part of a multidisciplinary approach no doubt does. Here is a study from Stefan Morbach, who's spoken here before, looking at the long-term prognosis for patients in uh, Zurst in Germany, a 10-year follow-up. And you see that uh, predictions of amputation, age dialysis therapy, and peripheral vascular disease, the mortality remains horrendous. The Eurodial project goes on. I'm not going to talk about this earlier study, but this one just published this month in Diabetes Care. Uh, 14 uh, European hospitals looking at health-related quality of life. 
There was a big variation in amputations across the center, but health-related quality of life was assessed in those predict presenting with foot ulcers. And the quality of life actually predicted major amputation and death, in other words, the worst quality of life, uh, but did not predict healing. So that's just published this month in Diabetes Care. Similarly, a very important paper from uh, Lazaro Martinez et al. from Spain, and uh, it was Fran Game who's speaking here later, and William Jeffcoat, who first really brought out in a large series published a few years ago that osteomyelitis alone can respond, that osteomyelitis in, localized in the foot can respond to antibiotics alone. But this is the first randomized controlled trial. 37 patients were randomized to antibiotics or surgical therapy. And basically, there was no difference in outcome between the two groups. So antibiotics alone can be used in forefoot ulcers with osteomyelitis as long as there isn't vascular disease or necrosis. And this was accompanied by an, an editorial or a commentary from Ben Lipsky, who's also here, which I uh, really asked him to write to go with this very important paper. And you can see this free because we put this as a listed paper on the front page of Diabetes Care, so you can download it free of charge immediately. In terms of gait analysis, our group in Manchester, we've been looking at foot pressures for many years, but we've now looked at stair negotiation. We have an excellent colleague, Neil Reeves, who was here last year, and he, together with ourselves, we've been looking at how patients negotiate stairs. We know falls and steadiness is common in diabetes, so we put markers on. You can assess during walking on the level or up and down stairs, and we can look at joint moments. Uh, and look at around uh, the, the contact time here, you see. But most important is a movie tells you a lot more than a picture. Here is a non-diabetic individual with no neuropathy coming downstairs. Nice, fast gait down the stairs. This is someone with neuropathy, a loss of proprioception, motor dysfunction. You can immediately see the difference here. Uh, and these data are soon to be published. Uh, and this is looking at the impact of neuropathy on gait. Falls, therefore, more common. Falls more common, Charcot more common. This patient greeted me when I first came to Manchester in 1986 as a consultant. And, and she was a tragedy, what I call malignant form of diabetes. Young, in her 40s, type 1 diabetes, blind. Just started peritoneal dialysis. Here's the patch for her ischemic heart disease and bilateral amputee. And again, it was Fran Game that started by showing that dialysis, the start of dialysis seemed to be accompanied by an increased uh, risk of foot ulcers or occurrence. This was in the British Medical Journal at the end of 2012. Patients' comments on what it's like to live on dialysis. Being on dialysis is not really a life, said Mr. Evans. It's not even half a life. Renata Carey, dialysis is brilliant, of course, but deeply horrendous. She was not diabetic. Her visual her observation on the dialysis unit, on the dialysis unit, patients suddenly appear with amputations. Before that... They have heavily bandaged feet, rapidly followed by crutches and then wheelchairs. This is a patient. These are, of course, the diabetic patients. And together with Larry Lavery, we've had a series of papers, the most recent review just published in the International Wound Journal, looking at dialysis and foot ulcers. Dialysis, we showed, is an independent risk factor for foot ulceration. Those with end-stage renal disease not on dialysis have four times decreased risk. So when you start dialysis, there's this increased risk of foot ulcers. Mortality is horrendous, and we believe there's a need for foot care for diabetic patients on the dialysis unit. And my ward round on Manchester, Monday morning this week, I walked into the dialysis unit, and they all say, oh, hello there, hello. They, they know me because half the patients on there have diabetes. Diabetes is number one cause now of end-stage renal disease. And, and we presented at the American Diabetes Association, soon to be published, that the overall mortality is horrendous for those who've already had a problem with their foot, an amputation, a local amputation, and are on dialysis. Their outlook is worse than almost every cancer other than lung cancer or pancreas. Shouldn't we therefore be saying that diabetes is not just a touch of sugar? This is a very serious disease, and we should be attracting the funding that other chronic specialties, especially heart disease and cancer, do. They're very good. We should learn from them, because in many ways, the outlook for people with diabetic complications is worse. So that's the story from Europe. Let's move to South America. And this is the International Diabetes uh, South and Central America region. And the step-by-step -step program uh, down there, uh, and uh, Christine Van Acker no doubt will be talking about this, but this is led up by my friend and colleague Linda Pedroza in Brasilia, who's a friend of this meeting. 
And of course, I was involved 20 years ago in helping start the program and setting up foot clinics across Brazil. So they are increasing the data from South America. They have the uh, train the foot trainers course. So they have experts coming in to be taught by people such as Christian Van Acker, and Carol Bakker, and uh, Stefan Morbach, uh, Neil, what do you call him, from uh, Ipswich, and so on. These are people that go out and help train the trainers how to spread the word of prevention of diabetic foot problems. They have a program in Spanish, Paso a Paso, and it's almost the same in Portuguese. They have uh, in uh, Melinda Pedrosa, the Brazilian, and uh, Daniel Brava, of course, we know as well here from Argentina. And they've done a lot in the step-by-step -step programs across Brasilia in all the regions. Uh, and this is their logo, the Brazilian Diabetic Foot Program. And here's the D Brazilian Diabetic Foot Group. And in the front uh, left here, you see Linda Pedrosa, who you know. So they're moving across Brazil, the largest country in South America. I think the landmass is as big, if not bigger, than the United States. And they've done a lot here, and the most important people in this program to train are those that are going to be out in the community, so it's primary care and especially nurses. So they've progressed across now, or, or most of the re major regions, uh, including, of course, down in the south, Porto Alegre, and up as far as Capino Grande and Recife in the north of Brazil. And this is the full Brazilian Train the Trainers course here, the basic course, rather. They've brought out the first Brazilian book on diabetic foot, and here's Linda launching it at their meeting. Uh, and, of course, they've had a number of Spanish programs, and especially across the Caribbean, you'll probably hear from Carol Baca that this is supported by the Rotary Club from a small town near Great Malvern, where we started our diabetic foot meetings 30 years ago in England. And, again, in the Spanish-speaking countries you see here, Predominant education going to primary care and to nurses, those who are going to take this out into the community. So that's the Spanish program, and that's the uh, Italian one. So, mucho obrigado, muchas gracias. And this, of course, is the beautiful cathedral at Brasilia, designed by Oscar Niemeyer, who recently died a year or so ago. Let's move to Asia. And great work comes, this is the Golden Temple at Kyoto, where Shigeo Kono, again a friend of this meeting, has been extremely active in the, that region of the world. And he's run a number of courses from 2006 onwards to the very recent one just a few weeks ago uh, in Kyoto in Japan. And here are some of the courses, and here is Shigeo Kono, and this year Stefan Morbach was there from Zerst in Germany. Each year he has some international speakers, and they cover countries including large countries such as China, uh, uh, Mongolia, Ulaanbaatar is quite active to the north of China, and poorer countries, Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, and so on. Uh, and you can see differences between the reports from Cambodia, Vietnam, Philippines, China, Japan. One thing we see is that the glycated hemoglobin, look how terrible it is there, 12%, we're aiming for less than 7% in most patients, 12% in Cambodia, and pretty poor right across, including the Philippines, even Thailand, China, the control is not good. There's nobody with good control in that region by the look of it. And they, they had reports from Thailand, uh, Doctor, I won't try and pronounce the name, from Bangkok, and he gave a very important paper on how things are developing in Thailand for diabetic foot. They just simply using the monofilament, for example, to use to define neuropathy. And he's looking at how much shoes are worn outside the house and inside the house and how common and this is something that we all know, and David particularly, I think, from his studies, knows that people think that home is safe. Barefoot gate, of course, home is not safe, and there can be many uh, disasters caused by problems walking barefoot. Very few wearing socks, hot climate. And then there was a report from Fiji, maybe a paradise, but it's a hot spot for diabetes as well, uh, and it's pretty grim there what is going on. Look at the number of patients in this small population here. Uh, many of them have got the complications, including nephropathy. And this was the recent meeting, therefore, uh, just a few weeks ago, less than a month ago, in uh, Kyoto, organized by Shigeo Kono there. Across the region, there are changes occurring, as there are across the world. The characteristics of the diabetic foot patients in the Western Pacific region is changing gradually. Uh, and we see from neuropathic more to neuroischemic and ischemic, more serious comorbidities, decreasing smoking, and across the world, even here, we're seeing increasing aging population. 
and their aims are to promote through again hubs and spokes, the hub in uh, Kyoto, and then moving out, people going across the region, educating on screening and management of neuropathy, vascular disease, and how to prevent and even treat foot ulcers. This is an interesting paper that I didn't present last year, but was presented at the last International Diabetic Foot Meeting, looking at the cost of treating diabetic foot ulcers across five countries in the world, led up by Peter Kavanagh. Chris Attinger, who I've already been talking to this morning, was the American uh, in Georgetown. Then we have Nino Rojas from Chile. Uh, we have our good friend, former general, uh, Zhang Rongzhu from Beijing in China. Uh, we have Abbas, who you know, from Dar es Salaam in Tanzania. And lastly, Aaron Bao from Mumbai and also Cochin in South India. So what they did here was to look at the how much it costs to have a foot problem. This is the GDP, gross domestic product per capita, in international dollars. 47,000 there compared with Tanzania, 1,400. So you see the huge difference. Chile number two, China number three, India there. Then they looked at the actual cost of a foot ulcer, a, a specific type of foot ulcer, I can't remember which this one particularly is, and unsurprisingly, the most expensive country is here for one foot ulcer episode. Look at the 188,000 compared with 3,000 for the same lesion, imaginative lesion in Tanzania. But this, the next slide is much more telling. How much it costs the patient to pay for that in terms of month of income, whereas it might be nine months if you're paying for yourself here, three months in China, it was over five years you would need your income to pay for one foot ulcer in, episode in India. And that tells us the serious effect that foot ulceration has on health economics and on individuals' family life. Lastly, let me turn to the sub-Saharan sub Africa. And Abbas has talked about the effectiveness of the step-by-step -step program, for example, in reducing rates of amputation in, in Tanzania. And he showed this slide, I think, uh, last year, the effectiveness on reducing amputation rates that started there, and you see the fall in amputation rates uh, afterwards. Foot problems, they're identifying. Foot ulcers are less common, so prevention. And again, outcomes in terms of amputations going up and heel foot ulcers uh, going down rather than heel foot ulcers going up. And by 2009, they had people in all across Tanzania, including over here in Zanzibar, uh, the beautiful island. If you're ever there, I would strongly recommend you visit it. But it's a hot spot for diabetes. And this is amputation and mortality. Again, look at the mortality rates. Uh, in Kenya here, 55%, 50% there in uh, Ethiopia, but it's going down gradually. We're looking at 12%, 10% mortality. That's still far too high and far too many amputations. He's recently contrasted the epidemiology, the differences between Asians. There's many Asians living in Africa uh, and uh, those indigenous uh, African individuals. And he's looked and compared and contrast, as it often says in an essay question, compare and contrast. He's compared and contrast the various demographics, age, duration of diabetes, delay in seeking medical attention. These are all similar, the degree of vascular disease, neuropathy, very, very common, you see. Type 1 diabetes, more common in the Africans. Lower body mass index, again, more common in Africans. Higher fasting glucose, gangrene, more common, and major amputation, more common in the Africans. In the Asians, more ischemic heart disease, cardiovascular disease, much more common, and other microvascular complications, including smoking, which contributes to that, of course. And again, results in mortality for both ethnic groups, we see here significantly high in those with vascular disease and infection and non-healing ulcers. So that's my global tour. I'm sure the United States, I know, is, is doing well. Other parts of the world are not doing so well. And I'll remind you of the words of Henri de Montville, who said in 1320, anybody who believes that anything can be suited to everyone is a great fool. Because medicine is practiced not on mankind, but on the individual patient. And we need to remember that. Guidelines are helpful. But they're only guidelines. They're not dictate. So take the guidelines and see how it fits into the individual patient. So not sarcastically, but Karl Marx seems, especially at my beginning of my talk, unusual to end with, but perhaps people over there should listen.
For centuries, scientists have attempted to describe the world. What matters is how to change it, and it shouldn't be changed by forced occupation, in my view, and that of my, all my colleagues from Ukraine. We need to change it by spreading the word, by increasingly screening, always taking the shoes and socks off of the diabetic patient every time you see them, and by remembering, put the patient first. They're usually right. Thank you very much.